Good morning, YouTubers. You have reached the Brian Sledge channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great day. Bye. Stores everywhere. Go grab it, read it to your family, get the audiobook, have a good time. Shannon Bream and the Fox News at Night team. Take it from here, Shannon. All right, Raymond, you, it's have all to, yours. you have to be honest with people, though, and let them know that once they pick it up, they will not be able to put it down. That's so what I love to the, hear. Clear the decks in the calendar if you're going to pick it up. You're very sweet, and yours. Very Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. Have a great fourth. Happy July fourth. Bye bye. All right, thank you. Raymond. We begin with the Fox News alert. Democratic Socialist Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio Cortez doubling down again tonight, comparing migrant border facilities to concentration camps. Hispanic pastors who say they've toured the same border facilities not long ago. Well, tonight they're saying they are shocked by what they call misinformation the freshman lawmaker is spreading. Well, stick around. You're going to hear one of those pastors. He joins me live. Then you can decide. That's coming up. And Nike dropping Betsy Ross American flag themed sneakers reportedly because Colin Kaepernick complained. Has that flag become a symbol of oppression? We'll debate. And later, breaking news on Navy SEAL Eddie Gallagher accused of killing an ISIS prisoner. We've got the verdict. Plus, brand new video related to Empire actor Jussie Smollett's alleged hate crime hoax. We have footage from the scene that night. We'll show it to you. Hello and welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. Battle lines being drawn tonight in the clash between Democratic lawmakers and Border Patrol officials and agents. Correspondent David Spun has the very latest news. Thank you, David. Hey, Shannon, a lot going on here tonight. There are new images depicting what's going on in these border facilities. Those images not coming from people inside, but directly from the inspector general with the Department of Homeland Security. That office tonight calling for immediate action using the words, quote, dangerous situation. These are some of the images showing border facilities in Texas, specifically McAllen, Texas and West Laco, Texas. The images show dozens of young adults and children cramped together in detention rooms. One of the captions reads, quote, standing room only from that report. Also, thousands have taken to the streets to protest outside ICE offices in major cities. In Boston, there were 18 arrests just today. Yesterday, a delegation made up of several members of Congress toured a facility near El Paso, Texas. Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez from New York says people inside were told to drink water from toilets. And today, another delegation toured a facility in South Florida. Congresswoman Madeline Dean from Pennsylvania was on that tour. They were crying, their affect was sad, profoundly sad, scared. Uh, in that cell uh, was a stainless steel toilet. We tried to operate the sink. Uh, when the sink didn't operate, the women said to us, no, that sink isn't working. Uh, we were told we can drink out of the toilets. Ocasio-Cortez called the facilities concentration camps in the past, and she doubled down tonight, tweeting, these are concentration camps. According to concentration camp experts, people began to die due to overcrowding, neglect, and shortage of resources. We saw all three of those signs on our trip yesterday. Another person died yesterday, and those are the deaths we know about. A man from Honduras died in a detention center yesterday. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi sent a letter to President Trump this week requesting that members of Congress are notified within 24 hours of a death at a facility. Now, where do we go from here? Democrats on the House Oversight Committee will have a hearing to address these disturbing reports on July 12th. Shannon Chairman Elijah Cummings requesting the presence of Acting Homeland Security Secretary Kevin McAleenan and Acting Border Protection Commissioner Mark Morgan at that hearing next Friday. Shannon. Okay, we will cover it. David Spunt, thank you very much. So let's dig a little deeper with a pastor who toured one of those border facilities in question. President of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, Reverend Samuel Rodriguez. Sir, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Okay, so you've heard what various members of Congress have said. Uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez is pushing back tonight against those who are questioning her. She says, the right is responding to what's been exposed at the border by denying it and saying, I'm lying. Hard to assert when the details I shared are corroborated by other members of Congress, court documents, migrant testimony, and now photos released today by the Inspector General. So, Reverend, what did you see there? Shannon, I must be living in a parallel universe somewhere. As a devoted Trekkie, uh, there must be some sort of you know, breach in the space-time continuum. I went this past Friday, I visited the controversial center in Clint, Texas, outside the outskirts of El Paso. 
I was driven by the same news stories that you and I both read, uh, compelled and driven by compassion and a concern for these migrant children. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a Christian committed to righteousness and justice. So I was driven, compelled. I called the White House and I asked for access and they granted it. I went there. I was not restricted at all as, as it pertains to what I could ask or where I could go. Here's what I discovered. I found kids created in the image of God, and I found Border Patrol agents created in the image of God working together in a very difficult environment. I did not find soiled diapers. I did not find crying children. I did not find deplorable conditions. Quite the opposite. I found amazing people on both sides trying to make a very difficult circumstance better. So I don't know where everyone else is visiting. I spoke to the Border Patrol agents, the vast majority of which, by the way, are Latino. And many of them attend the churches that are part of our network. And I asked, hey, guys, did you stage this? Did you guys flip the script just to accommodate people like me? And they went, Pastor Sam, absolutely not. You are looking at the very thing that existed here for a number of weeks. So it's not that we shifted because of any deplorable conditions that were discovered. What I also discovered was that the original report, the attorneys that actually reported the soil diapers and deplorable conditions, they never, ever walked through the center. Let me repeat that. They never visited what I visited. They took that information anecdotally from interviews with children, with children, mind you, from the age of two to the age of 17. Okay. So the, tr the truth sets you free. So let's talk about what, what the inspector general, though, found. These are government inspectors from the Department of Homeland Security. They released the pictures that we're using. They are saying, this has got to stop. We need help. There is a problem there. These facilities were never made for this amount of people. Um, part of the inspector general report said senior managers at several facilities raised security concerns for their agents and the detainees. For example, one called the situation, quote, a ticking time bomb. Pastor, how do we get something done? Yep. And again, I, I won't even deny or come against whatever the inspector general reported. I visited one center. Now, in full disclosure, some of the agents were likewise expressing the angst, the consternation, and the frustration. They never signed up for this, especially when the when the borders were in a de facto way opened up. Our asylum system, our immigration system is so broken that it becomes precarious for everyone involved. I would agree and sign off on the statement coming from the inspector general's office. We got here because Republicans and Democrats both failed miserably. We got here because Congress, Congress is playing politics with millions of individuals, with the sovereignty of our nation, and with the protection of our border. We got here because it's, it's empathy, it's apathy. We got here because of political expediency. We need to act now. I mean, I hope and pray this Inspector General's report, but in the full balance of things, what I am completely against is condemnation, shaming, and coming against those Border Patrol agents that are trying trying their best to make a very difficult circumstance better for those involved. Well, Pastor, I'm sure that you, like, including me and many other people, play, pray that our, our leaders will have wisdom and compassion. This is not an easy thing to solve, but they've got to come together regardless of party and fix it. Pastor, In thank Jesus you. In Jesus' name, thank you. Our new tonight, a federal judge has blocked a Trump administration policy that would keep asylum seekers detained. That policy, announced by the Attorney General in April, would deny a bond hearing to asylum seekers with a credible fear of persecution uh, if returned to the places they fled. That lawsuit was filed by the ACLU and other immigrants' rights advocates. No word yet if the administration will appeal it. Well, celebration of America or political rally. The debate over the president's Independence Day plans for D.C. growing more heated tonight. But that might be overshadowed by breaking news from the Justice Department. Correspondent Kristen Fisher on the White House beat covering it all for us tonight. Hey, Kristen. Hey, Shannon. Yeah, this is a pretty dramatic reversal from the Trump administration. Less than 24 hours ago, President Trump was talking about delaying the 2020 census after the Supreme Court temporarily blocked the administration from adding a question to the census about citizenship. Now the administration is standing down. And just moments ago, President Trump tweeted, quote, a very sad time for America when the Supreme Court of the United States won't allow a question of, is this person a citizen of the United States, to be asked on the 2020 census. Going on for a long time, I've asked the Department of Commerce and the Department of Justice to do whatever is necessary to bring this most vital of questions and this very important case to a successful conclusion. But the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, said earlier today that they have already started printing the census without that citizenship question on it.
Despite that setback, though, President Trump has to be very pleased with the massive fundraising haul that his campaign announced earlier today. It is absolutely huge. His campaign, along with the RNC, raised $105 million in the second quarter, including a staggering $100 million cash on hand. That's more than double what the Obama campaign had raised at this point in their re-election cycle. So what is the campaign going to do with all of that money? The money that we have now allows us to kind of look at each donor now, build better models, build better audiences, and really understand who a Trump supporter is today so we can deliver more tomorrow. Now, in two days, it is the 4th of July, and President Trump is going all out with his salute to America on the National Mall. He's promising the biggest fireworks display ever, a flyover of Air Force One, Marine One, the Blue Angels, and more. Tanks are going to be on display near the Lincoln Memorial, where President Trump will be speaking. He's promising a nonpartisan speech, one that will focus on patriotism, not politics. But critics like his 2020 rival, Congressman Tim Ryan, say, quote, the president is showboating and wasting taxpayer funding just to inflate his ego. Our armed forces and military assets are not political props. We know we're the most powerful country in the world. We don't need to brag about it. This isn't North Korea. So, Shannon, the big question, of course, is how much is all of this going to cost? But at least for now, the Trump administration isn't saying what the final price tag is going to be to taxpayers. Oh, uh, Kristen, we're going to debate that in a little bit because that uh, debate is raging tonight. Uh, by the way, Vice President Mike Pence, no public event scheduled tomorrow. After abruptly canceling a trip to New Hampshire today, when that started to bubble up, everybody's minds went a million places. What, what do you know about that abrupt change of plans today? Shannon, it is still quite a mystery. All we know is that according to the vice president's press secretary, that this last minute cancellation had nothing to do with any sort of health or medical emergencies, and it also didn't have anything to do with any national security issues. All the press secretary would say is that the vice president had to stay in D.C. for some reason, and it's going to be revealed within the next week or weeks. So quite the tease there, Shannon, but tonight that reason still under wraps. The mystery continues. All right, Kristen Fisher, thank you very much. Thanks. All right, Nike, yanking merchandise from across America. Because An activist, Colin Kaepernick, reached out to Nike to say that he and others felt the flag is an offensive symbol because of its connection to an era of slavery. Kaepernick hasn't played in the NFL since 2016, the year he started kneeling during the national anthem. But last year, Nike made him the face of an advertising campaign. And the company is clearly standing behind that relationship. Quoting now, Nike made the decision to halt distribution of the Air Max One based on concerns that it could unintentionally offend and detract from the nation's patriotic holiday. In response, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey is canceling financial incentives meant to help Nike build a manufacturing plant in Arizona. Ducey tweeted, quote, words cannot express my disappointment at this terrible decision. I'm embarrassed for Nike. Nike is an iconic American brand and American company. This country, our system of government and free enterprise have allowed them to prosper and flourish. Missouri GOP Senator Josh Hawley wrote, quote, Nike thinks a American flag is symbol of oppression? What planet are you on? Nike is anti-American, plain and simple. And Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says when the flag becomes controversial, we're in trouble. Watch. I hope Nike either releases these shoes or some other shoemaker uh, picks up the flag, puts it on a pair of shoes and starts selling it. I'll make the first order. This comes as U.S. pride takes a dive. A new Gallup poll shows just 45% of U.S. adults are extremely proud to be Americans. That's the lowest measure in the poll's 18-year history. Between 2002 and 2004, post 9-11, 70% we're extremely proud to be Americans. And it's notable, when Nike hired Colin Kaepernick as a spokesperson, sales went up. Shannon. All right, Trace Gallagher, thank you very much. So, Nike now dealing with a barrage of backlash over what critics say are two politically correct, highly controversial decisions, one in the U.S., one in China. So let's debate. The civil rights attorney, Robert Patillo, and Fox News contributor, Jason Chaffetz, by the way, has a new book coming out, Power Grab, The Liberal Scheme to Undermine Trump, the GOP, and Our Democracy. You can pre-order it now if you like that kind of stuff.
And they loved your last book. So um, we'll see, Jason. Uh, good luck. Thank you both for joining Thanks, us uh, to talk about Nike tonight. Um, okay, Project 21, which is a conservative black group, they say they give voice to conservative blacks in America. Uh, one of their members, Christopher Arps, says this, unfortunately for Nike, they are going down the same disastrous path as ESPN by destroying their iconic brand with their political activism. Robert. Well, this is a completely ridiculous conversation and argument to be had. It was not an American, the American flag on the back of that shoe. It was the, the 1776 so-called Betsy Ross flag, which has been co-opted by white supremacist groups on the Internet. That is what this is about. The same way Pepe the Frog went from a cartoon to a white supremacist issue, the same way that the Tiki Torch went from a backyard barbecue accessory to a white supremacist in image, so has this flag. So the entire point of diversity in boardrooms is to avert corporate scandals and, uh, and issues that, uh, that arise. So by Colin Kaepernick speaking up, they probably saved Nike mm -hmm. millions of dollars by the bad press that would have came out. This is not a, Nike does not advertise to Mitch McConnell. They advertise to a generation of young millennials between 15 and 25 who paid $250 for a pair of LeBron James sneakers, and they are the people who would have had an issue with this symbol. Okay. And if Mitch McConnell is mad, he can go somewhere and buy different shoes. Something tells me someone's going to put out a shoe with the Betsy Ross flag on it. I will be stunned if that's not on the market by tomorrow. Okay, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Jason, says this, under the guise of heritage, symbols of early U.S. history have long been adopted by hate groups set on returning to a time when all non-white people were viewed as subhuman and un-American. They say people need to be more sensitive to the fact that for some people this is oh, the flag of the United States of America on the week of, of the 4th of July. That is absolutely absurd. And shame on Nike for buying into this, this whole fabrication. We should understand that it is the flag that is something bigger than all of us and the horrific past. I mean, some of the horrific things that happened in this country in the past, what drew us together is a bigger, better cause. The Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, and the flag that drew us together I don't know why all these people miss this in grade school, but we are the greatest nation on the face of the planet. Despite our hard times in the past, we learn, we get better, and we salute that flag, and we fight for America. And that is exactly the opposite of what I hear Nike and Colin Kaepernick and all these other people projecting. It's just fundamentally wrong. Well, and there are some who, who worry that this kind of stuff actually helps President Trump. Joe Scarborough among them tweeting this. The Betsy Ross flag is now a symbol of white nationalism and slavery, not defiance against a distant monarchy. Really, Nike? PC madness is accelerating just in time for 2020. Trump feeds on your reflexive wokeness. Great job, everybody. Robert? Joe Scarborough is an idiot. Uh, what we have to understand and, uh, and have to look at is the fact that these troops who are serving overseas right now are not wearing the Betsy Ross flag. The Capitol right now is not flying the Betsy Ross flag. If Nike had placed these 50 stars and, uh, and 13 stripes on those shoes and the people had an issue with that, then yes, I would agree with you. But that is not the American flag. That is not the flag that represents every American right now. So let's, let's salute the flag that we fly today, not the one that we flew 200 years ago. Okay, when it Betsy comes to Ross, really? Uh, Betsy Ross? By the way, Ross? By the way I did, Ross Ross did even Betsy create Ross. the flag. Guys. That was a myth that was made up a hundred years later. Okay, okay. I played Betsy yeah. Ross in a kindergarten play. I'm sure there are pictures out there and hopefully I'm not going to be in trouble for that. <laughs> uh, but Fox News has a new poll out where he asked people about whether they think certain things are patriotic. And one of those things was, is flying the flag an act of patriotism? Uh, back in 2014, 94% of Americans said yes. That's dropped 9% since then. Now 85% say yes. Um, Jason, are you worried about the level of patriotism in this country, especially we head into Independence Day celebrations? Yeah, yeah. I, I heard somebody and I, they kind of snarkily said, uh, you know, are you a Democrat or are you an American? Because how Democrats cannot rally behind the flag? Why is it that the one place where we can set politics and everything aside and say, you know what, we love this country. We love the men and women who have served it, who have sacrificed, who have given their life for this country. We love the flag. That should not be a partisan issue. It should be 110% patriotic for everyone. All right, Robert and Jason, we got to leave it there, but a happy Independence Day to both of you heading into this uh, later this week. Thank you both. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. All right, Iran levels new threats, and the left says President Trump is to blame for the terms. Iran cannot possess more than 300 kilograms of low enriched uranium, a limit that was surpassed yesterday. Tehran is also threatening to break another commitment in the deal by enriching uranium above 3.67 percent. The United States unilaterally withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal last year before reimposing sanctions on the country.
As Iran's economy crumbles, leadership in Tehran is believed to have ordered a series of attacks on Western-linked oil infrastructure this summer before shooting down a U.S. drone. This led the U.S. to send a carrier strike group to the Gulf, and today, U.S. Central Command confirmed that nearly a dozen F-22 fighter jets were deployed to a U.S. base in Qatar last week. Yesterday, the president said in the Oval Office that Iran is playing with fire, prompting a direct response from the Speaker of Iran's parliament. Mr. Trump needs to understand that when you use the language of a bully against a civilized nation, they become more united. If he were to understand this notion, a lot of the problems they face in the region would be resolved. While European countries have looked for a way to ease the economic pressure on Iran, a number of countries, including Japan and Iraq, have offered to mediate a peaceful resolution. So far, no solutions have been found. In Jerusalem, Trey Yingst, Fox News. So the Trump administration is confident in its maximum pressure campaign on Iran. Meanwhile, the New York Times are reporting that in new talks, the president may accept a nuclear freeze by North Korea, as opposed to full denuclearization. And that sparked a no-holds-barred response from National Security Advisor John Bolton. So let's bring in the former chief of staff to John Bolton, Fred Flights, president and CEO of the Center for Security Policy. Welcome. Good to have you back with us tonight. Good to be here, Shannon. Okay, so um, let's start with Newsweek. Under this headline, Iranian official says errors, mistakes have increased under current weird president Donald Trump. That's their word. Says some Democrats and many analysts have accused the Trump administration of pushing Iran into the current situation. They've pointed out that Iran was complying with the International Nuclear Treaty, arguing that the White House has increased tensions unnecessarily by withdrawing from the landmark deal. And they point to a number of experts and analysts who say... They are in compliance, whether you like the deal or not. They were abiding by it. Well, that's conventional wisdom, but it's false. Iran has been violating this agreement since the very beginning. For example, to get $150 billion in sanctions relief in early 2016, Iran was supposed to provide a full and accurate accounting of its nuclear program. The reason is that the inspectors had to know what to inspect for. Everyone knew in late 2015 that that accounting was false. And last year, Israel stole a huge amount of documents on, on Iran's nuclear program that showed they were going to make up to five nuclear weapons that could be carried in missiles. They were going to conduct underground nuclear tests. They were trying to acquire nuclear weapons fuel from other countries. Blatant violation. Iran has also never allowed inspections of military sites and other denied areas. So the idea they've been in compliance, I know there's lots of people who say that. The facts show that that's just not true. Okay, so uh, this happened, uh, the Iran nuclear deal, under the Obama and Biden administration. Of course, the former vice president now running to become president next year um, tweeted this out. He says, Iran has now restarted its nuclear program and has become more rather than less aggressive. Trump's Iran policy has alienated us from our allies and taken us to the brink of another war in the Middle East. Everything this president does is backwards. He says their administration had it right. This administration has undone everything that would have protected us and made things worse. Well, the issue right now is Iran's in uranium enrichment. They're stepping up over a cap of 300 kilograms per year to 600 or more. The issue here isn't whether uh, Donald Trump caused this violation, because basically, why was Iran enriching it in the first place? Iran has no reason to enrich uranium. It's cheaper to get enriched uranium fuel rods on the open market. Iran was enriching for two reasons. First of all, to perfect its capability to make nuclear weapons fuel and to have something it could turn to to blackmail the international community if it wasn't satisfied with the nuclear deal. That's what it's doing here. So are you saying that there was evidence that they were violating the deal before this president pulled out from it because I know that there are some who've said listen they forced a, they he his withdrawal forced them into this position where they've gone beyond the enrichment limits are you saying that was happening before he withdrew or do we know for sure no there's clear evidence they were withdrawing on their declaration of the nuclear program their refusal to allow inspections of military facilities but Iran shouldn't have been enriching in the first place it's a very dangerous technology Netanyahu Senator Lieberman has said you can't have a meaningful nuclear agreement while Iran is engaging in this technology the only purpose of which is to improve its capability to make nuclear weapons fuel. That's the most difficult stage of making a nuclear weapon. That is a concession that should never have been agreed to. Where do we go from here, though? I mean, you know, we've had the drone shot down. We've had attacks on the ships in the region. Iran's pointing fingers at us. We're pointing fingers at them. Obviously, things are ratcheted up. They're now looking to the European parties to this agreement, saying, like, we'll only stay in as long as you guys keep your part of the deal as well. Um, our, our administration says we want to get back to the table and have a discussion, but it's got to be a completely different deal. 
What happens next? Well, the president's policy is actually working fairly well. He's denying funds that Iran would use for terrorism, for Hezbollah in Lebanon, for troops in Syria. We don't have to do anything. Iran is trying to use violence to force President Trump to change his policies, to try to blackmail us, to change our policies. That simply is going to work. And frankly, this is alienating the Europeans. They don't want to support Iran anymore. Mm -hmm. They see the shoot down of this drone, uh, assassination squads in Europe. We should stay the course until Iran is prepared to negotiate. If they're not, we have a successful policy. All right, Fred Flights, thank you for dropping in. Good to be here. Good to see you. Okay, the Russian Defense Ministry says a fire on one of its Navy's deep sea submersibles has killed 14 sailors. The ministry is not saying how the fire started, how many people were on board, or if there were some survivors. Russian media report the accident occurred on the country's most secret submarine, a nuclear powered vessel designed for sensitive missions at great ocean depths. Late breaking news on multiple fronts tonight. A verdict in the trial of Navy SEAL Eddie Gallagher accused of war crimes, plus new video footage from the scene of the alleged. He's got the latest. Jonathan. Good evening, Shannon. Chief Gallagher awaits formal sentencing on the one minor charge on which he was found guilty, but is tonight, in the words of his attorney, a free man. He was found not guilty on six of seven charges, including the murder of a wounded ISIS prisoner and the attempted murder of two Iraqi civilians. The one guilty verdict was on posing for a picture with the body of the dead ISIS fighter. Chief Gallagher's attorneys and his wife, who has been by his side throughout this trial, said outside court it was a case that should never have been brought. This vindication, I hope, will be a lesson learned to everybody that we need to uphold innocent until proven guilty, due process, and we need to afford the benefit of the doubt to our war heroes who we send over there to fight these evils. Amen. I think this whole thing is disgusting. And the Gallaghers say they're looking forward to celebrating freedom on the 4th of July. We just want to celebrate today uh, and the victory that we have and my husband being a free man. What do the coming days look like for you and your family? What do you, do you have plans? They look like, freedom. I don't know. Freedom. Yeah, freedom. freedom. <laughs> Formal sentencing on that one guilty verdict will come tomorrow, but the maximum prison term Chief Gallagher could face on the posing for a picture charge is four months. He has already served nine months pre-trial, so he will not be going back to jail. Shannon? Jonathan Hunt, thank you very much. Newly released video shows footage of the night actor Jussie Smollett says two men targeted him in a racist and homophobic attack in Chicago. Now, the police there released surveillance videos in response to a Freedom of Information Act request, and Matt Finn has been going through, through the footage for us. Uh, what has he found? Matt? Shannon, Fox News obtained this video via a Freedom of Information request, and really, it appears to show Jussie Smollett and the brothers walking around the area of the alleged crime the night that it happened. The first piece of video appears to show the Ocindaro brothers walking toward the direction of Smollett's apartment building on a sidewalk. Chicago police and the brothers' attorney tell us this video is the brothers, and in it, you can clearly see the flash of a red-brimmed hat. Police notes and surveillance video shows one of the brothers apparently purchasing a red brimmed hat along with other items like the thin white rope to be used during the alleged hoax. Also, the new video shows Smollett walking in the middle of the street in the same white sweater he was later seen wearing. When police arrived, he might have been smoking, according to police notes. And as you could see on the video, it was such a frigid night here in Chicago, there's hardly anyone else in sight other than what appears to be Smollett and the brothers. Another new piece of video from a garage appears to show Smollett in the white sweater again, looking calm, perhaps a cell phone in his hand. And then a very short while later, what also appears to be, but not certain, the Osendaro brothers seen walking down the same sidewalk. The attorney for the brothers tells Fox News that the brothers likely arrived early and kind of were circling the area waiting for Smollett to return. What's noteworthy here is that all this video appears to show the key players near the scene of the crime right around the time that it happened. So far, Jesse Smollett and his legal team maintain that Smollett is the true victim of a hate crime and had nothing to do with the hoax. Shannon. Matt Finn, thank you very much. Well, illegal immigrants could soon find a bill that would allow non-citizens to hold party leadership roles. If passed, the law would allow non-citizens to serve as convention delegates and county committee leaders. Meanwhile, a California sheriff is warning that selfies are harming local farms and agriculture. Officials say that perfect backdrop to snap a picture 
is often actually private property. And some California landowners are unhappy selfie takers are trespassing, trampling on flowers and causing traffic congestion. Well, watch your step in Hawaii. A new law going into effect this week punishes pedestrians for entering a crosswalk while a countdown timer is flashing. And offenders could face steep fines up to $130. The only time there you'll be legally allowed to cross the street is when you see a picture of a walking man or an upraised palm on a pedestrian crossing light. Finally, controversy brewing in Fort Worth, Texas, an atheist organization flying banners in several downtown locations that read, In No God We Trust. The banners promote an education seminar taught by the Metroplex Atheist. About 100 complaints have been filed so far. Although many disagree with the message, city officials say they can't abridge free speech rights and no law has been broken. Well, breaking tonight, the man who saved Chrysler, Lee Iacocca, has died at the age of 94. Iacocca's hallmark achievements include adding the iconic Mustang to Ford's lineup in the 1960s, and then engineering a huge corporate turnaround as CEO of Chrysler in the early 80s. Well, founding father Thomas Jefferson's hometown will no longer... It'll look bad when he makes it political, just like we know he's done because he's done this at military bases. He's done it plenty of times. Uh, it really is about his ego, but it's not worth really getting into it because at the end of the day, uh, the focus should be on our nation's independence. And, uh, you know, our founding fathers meant for this to be a day where we celebrated democracy, representation. Um, we fought this, uh, the, the, the Revolutionary War precisely because we had taxation without representation. Okay, I gotta go, guys. Uh, it wasn't about military might, but it, it's fine. It'll, well, it'll be a it's about July celebrating America, it and I think we're all in agreement. That's a wonderful thing. And having the president speak. Things change. Policing has remained the same, which is a policy of not engaging with militant protesters. Mm. Joining me now is Harmeet Dillon. She's the attorney for Andy No. Harmeet, thank you for being here. How is Andy doing tonight? And what new information have you learned about the attack on your client? Well, Andy is struggling, to be frank. I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, the speech affect, affect that you see there is much slower than his normal way of talking and his pace of speaking. And so uh, it's very troubling for anybody who knows him to see him like that. Uh, we're going to be sure that he gets some neurological uh, tests and support going forward so that he recovers fully mm -hmm. because he's a very bright young man. Uh, uh, he just published a piece in the Wall Street Journal tonight about his ordeal. Yeah. So what we've learned since the attack is a lot more details about who did what and in what sequence. I mean, there's been a great amount of people uh, on the Internet helping to source identification from different angles of the attackers. And so with all of the police uh, of all of the pressure that has gone on uh, on the press um, from the press on what happened there, we've had a lot of um, uh, pressure on the police to identify specific assailants and then seek support from the public to put a name to a face. And so this afternoon, the uh, police department put out a press release identifying mm. pictures of some people and asking for the public mm. to help identify them and putting out a reward as well. Yeah, no, it's terrifying. I mean, I'm reading reports of fiberglass in the gloves, uh, steel knuckles. I mean, it, it, it's terrifying what's going on. Now, you tweeted out earlier, Harmeet, that you would sue into oblivion the people who did this. Are you talking about the Antifa protesters? or the city, the city themselves, who really, uh, you allege, stood by and did nothing? Well, I'm going to reserve judgment on who in government uh, deserves to be sued. I think that's an open question. And today we're seeing some fissures between the police department and the mayor's office. It looks like they're pointing fingers at each other over this situation. But mm -hmm. I think what is indisputable from experts who are watching the crowd control situation there is that uh, is that the police uh, staffing was was understaffed for the type of event that it was, the you know anticipated riot. They've had these riots there frequently, and they don't. Mm -hmm prepare for them properly. This isn't a podunk town. It's a big city. Uh, right. But in terms of the actual criminals, you know, they get away with it. They're allowed to walk around with masks. Oregon is a state that does not ban mm. masks. Ironically, California does ban masks in the use of a crime. So they get away with it. They come again and again. It's the same people. They knew Andy's name. And this has to stop. And even if they're broke and living mm. in their parents' basement, I intend to sue these people into oblivion and make sure they're never able to do anything like this again. I don't care if they're bankrupt. We will, we will make sure that they feel some pain for what they did to Andy. Harmate Dillon, thank you for being here. We will check in with you as this case proceeds. Up next, which celebs are lining up to audition for a new 
Mueller Report movie on. Joining me with the answers is the very funny Tom Shalou. So, Tom, you were captivated by this trailer. Why didn't they call you to read? Uh, that's what I want to no, know. That's my first question. I didn't get a call. I would have submitted an audition. Well, I'm you ready could, to go. Believe me, you would have been an improvement over what I just saw. Well, you know, a lot of people, wait, how many dr dramatic readings of the Mueller report are we going to have? Congress tried it. Right. And then we had the, the one that was on stage. You hear at a church in Riverside, right? The, on, the, on the west side of Manhattan. Yeah. A-list actors. Yes, doing this thing. big names. Now, a lot of conservatives, I thought, missed the boat on this because they said, oh, look at these people trying to breathe life into the Mueller report. It's so boring. Oh, it's this <laughs> lawyerly. It's actually not boring. It's not lawyerly. The report is very dramatic. It's full of dialogue and stage direction. I'm telling you, <laughs> Mueller wrote Wrote it for these people. It's for the Hollywood crowd. And so it's really, this is where he wanted and, it to be. And, and this is a Tom Steyer who's a billionaire. It's his shtick to try to raise the profile of the Mueller report again. Yeah, maybe in 70 millimeter next time. Didn't we'll work. Depictions of smoking among young people are on the rise once more, especially on Netflix, apparently, Tom. A follow up report to the Truth Initiative's 2018 study on the depictions of smoking on streaming services reveals that Netflix's Stranger Things is leading the pack of the 13 shows surveyed. Stranger Things accounts for 22 percent of the tobacco depictions. The report found that the appearances of tobacco have nearly tripled compared to the 2015-2016 season. So, Tom, don't you wish they had something like this for sexual depictions and, <laughs> you know, uh, subversive themes being given to our youth. Well, that's the thing is, I, I don't let my kids watch any of this stuff. Tobacco is the last thing I'm worried about. If it's, t <laughs> see, it's you, you, have you have a light? You have a light? No, already, I'm just taking a break. You're all sorts of rules. I, no, I'm not smoking it. I'm not smoking it. But just the, a shtick. my kids watch almost exclusively tobacco smoking in their entertainment because I watch all the old movies. Oh. We watch Casablanca. We watch Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Yeah. Everybody smoking. It was we cool watch, then. You know, we watch Get Smart together. I mean, I will only watch the old shows because it's much cleaner content, but everybody is smoking. Well, you can even watch the old news reports. You've got yeah, Edward R. Murrow. They were, they all, everybody had an ashtray. Johnny Carson, this. come back right. from the commercial. He'd be that, smoking. It looked like incense. Didn't from, hurt me. Did I end up smoking? No. It didn't. You see, I hate smoking. Very bad for you. In a shocking story out of Seattle this week, the University of Washington Department of Radiology, Tom, is reportedly paying pregnant women to join a study exploring how marijuana use affects unborn infants. The university received a grant of $190,000 from the National Institute on Drug Abuse for the study, and the women who complete it get $300. Talk about payment disparity. To, to spend <laughs> however they wish. That, that's odd. Now, they, they gave us a statement, and the, the University of Washington, they said the study is enrolling women who have already used or are using marijuana. So they're not paying to make the women smoke marijuana. It's like the old, remember the dentine commercial, four out of five dentists recommend for the patients who chew gum. So this is only for people who are already, are already smoking pot and pregnant. We recommend that you don't do that. But to tell you the truth, if someone is smoking pot while they're pregnant, I, I mean, I'd rather have somebody do a study you know, monitor them. They're probably doing and warn things. everybody else. Yes. Yeah. I, I, marijuana mommies are not a, not, not a good, good move. Not, not a good, good thing. Tom, thanks. And thanks for